One girl is living in a world surrounded by death. Despite the chaos and the pain around her, she has one thing keeping her afloat, books. She steals them and has learned to read with the help of a loving, artistic foster father. But this story isn't about sadness. It's about color, life, and the people who paint our world. The girl, Liesl. The book, The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's, Let's get, get lit. lit. Hey, 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 Alexis. Hey, Kari. Oh, yeah, this is Kari. <laughs> and this is Alexis. And you're listening to Lit Society, a show about books and drama. It's good to see you again. Always a pleasure. You know, we ain't seen each other in a while. (laughs) That's right. That's right. A whole week. Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) I wanted to follow up on last week's episode. We said we'd reconvene today to talk about how we can make $10,000 in 10 days, as was outlined in last week's book. Let's wait one more week. You guys, listeners, send us your businesses. Let us know how you plan to make $10,000 in 10 days. Um, You can contact us via email or Instagram, and we will reconvene next week um, so that we can all support each other in this goal. Now, um, Alexis, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. You look great. to To the book. Yes, me too. And I'm your comments to on it. I really would okay. like to know what you think of it and hear your input on it. I'm excited about that. I am. Yeah, likewise. I want to know what you... I was thinking when I was reading it, like, what is Alexis thinking about this part? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> well, um, before we dive into our theme of the week and then cover this week's book, I want to do something that I didn't prepare Alexis for, and oh, that's Lord. a bit of society says. Don't worry. I'm not putting you on the spot, girlfriend. Oh, so. Society Says You Guys is where we share your comments with the rest of our lit society. And we don't do this every week, but every once in a while, we want to highlight you. So this comment is from Instagram user Blitzy underscore Ash. And she says, I just started listening to this podcast. Had me in stitches laughing out loud. I needed this in my life right now. I love that. Thank you, Blitzy. Thank you. We love that. (laughs) Blitzy. Get, yes, get it right. Guys, <laughs> yes, Bilzy <laughs> underscore Ash. And if you, listener, want to have your comment read on our show, go ahead and Instagram us, DM us, or leave a comment on Apple Podcasts along with um, a five-star review. We really appreciate that. So each week, readers, oh, oh, oh. Also, did you guys know we're a video podcast now? That's right. Every episode, every week, you can see our faces on YouTube. And sometimes we have like visual aids. <laughs> I don't I don't know why I'm doing this. We don't have one this week. Um, but that <laughs> <Visual>. is <laughs> right. That is Lit Society right Pod <laughs> on the YouTube. So each week, readers, we choose a theme to discuss inspired by the book we're reading. And this week, our theme is burning books, six outrageous, tragic and weird examples in history. Mm. Alexis. What's the, uh, are you familiar with burning books as either a political tool or social distraction? (laughs) Yeah. um, Yeah, I've heard of it. Um, Mm I, yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, this article comes from the Washington Post, and this is from 2021. Um, And they bring out how at that time, and I forgot about this, but there was this debate about what books should be read in school. Now, a lot of kids grew up reading Tom Sawyer and um, other quote unquote classics, Charles Dickens. Um, But as other books by uh, other writers were becoming more popular, um, certain politicians were even suggesting we burn these books in the street, throw them in the fire. Mm. And so this prompted the article as we take a look down memory lane. The first known book lighting ceremony was in 213 BCE in China. That's a really long time ago. I didn't know they had, we had books back then. A book lighting ceremony. This sounds really positive in a building. 
Yeah, burn them scrolls. Yes, <laughs> 213 BCE, China. And then we go to the 1500s CE, Mexico. And these were Mayan texts, the indigenous Mayans. Y'all know they was doing everything. Um, reading, writing, arithmetic. Okay, everything I couldn't do in school, the Mayans were doing in the 1500s. The indigenous Mayans and the Catholic bishop at the time, Diego de Landa, encountered um, they encountered each other on the Yucatan Peninsula in the 16th century. By the way, you guys, if you want to know more about the Yucatan Peninsula, check out my YouTube channel. That's Chicagoings. This is so tacky. YouTube.com slash Chicago INGS. I know you support me, Alexis. Uh-huh, okay. but it's not tacky. This is your is, show. You can do what about you want. book burning. <laughs> Okay. Okay, but I got a vlog there from the Yucatan. Anyway, they trusted him and they shared some of their sacred texts with him. And these texts included writings preserved with their original hieroglyphics. So this was like a big deal. Well, a few years later, Landa betrayed that trust and accompanied by other church officials, he gathered as many of these books as he could find and burned them. He burned them. They were full of superstitions and lies, he's, he later wrote. We burned them all, which they regarded to an amazing degree, or re, which they regretted, excuse me, to an amazing degree, and which caused them great affliction. Yeah, he was burning their books. Then we go on to 1840s France. But why in the 1840s were they burning books? I'll tell you, it's full of petty drama. So there's this <laughs> French school. <laughs> there's this French school for the blind. And this is actually where Louis Braille developed his emboss.code method to teach so that um, blind people could read. Of course, the Braille method. Well, there was an instructor there named Dufal. And he was afraid because this method was not useful to seeing teachers that soon the school wouldn't have seeing teachers. There was another method that was easier for teachers that could see, but the Braille method was like too exclusive. Like, Oh, why the Braille just for the blind? For real. (laughs) So so he was like, Hey y'all, let's burn all the Braille books at this blind school that I teach. at." Yes. Yep. So after the Braille book burning students and other teachers at the school, rebelled and continued to use the braille in secret why because it's for people who can't see i think i said deaf sorry you guys it's early no they're blind of course so anyway of course they kept using the braille method it's the best method that we currently have for those not seeing eventually dufal relented and in later years he even claimed a measure of credit for braille's invention he's like book burning i didn't do that i invented the braille method why ain't it named after me a uh, politics <laughs> then the late 1800s and guess where that's right the united states that was what i was thinking i mean you had in all the countries and they foolishness <laughs> And that's the point to me. All over the world, this has been a tactic. It's wild. So in the late 1800s, the United States, um, in the United States, the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice was so for burning books that their emblem even has a depiction of the act. This is like their brand seal. They was like, this is what we do. We burn books. It's founder. Anthony Cornstock was so disgusted by the proliferation of pornography among fellow soldiers that he said, let's burn all the pornographic books, including medical journals, anatomy textbooks, and especially anything providing women with information about contraception. Because that's pornography. Medical textbooks? Yeah. Anatomy books? Well, he's not done. Cornstock later declared books are feeders for brothels. <laughs> Give a woman a book. You might as well burn a bro- uh, start a brothel. Anyway, wow. that's depressing. Depressing. But he um, allegedly oversaw the destruction of 15 tons of books. Wow. Wow. 1900s Germany. Who do you think we're talking about here, Alexis? 19... 19- Hundreds, oh, Germany. Um, uh, Hitler. 
So the Nazi party, right? Tens mm-hmm. of thousands of books were burned within months of the Nazi seizure of power in Germany, starting with a nationwide event on May 10th, 1933. Student-led Nazi groups gathered in 34 university towns to destroy copies of books that propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels had deemed un-German. Oh, I shouldn't do that. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, this included works by socialists such as Karl Marx and Helen Keller. Um, a Jewish writer, Heinrich Hein, whose works were also burnt by Nazis, by the way, once famously wrote, where they burn books, they'll also ultimately burn people. Mm. So true. Mm. And finally, we land back in the United States in the 2000s. However, via Afghanistan. Oh. Now, no book has been persecuted more throughout history than the Bible. Right. In 2009, 2009, <laughs> copies of the Christian Bible were burned by the U.S. military in Afghanistan. The Bibles have been translated into Dari and Pashto and sent to members of the military at a base um, full of Christians. Okay. By It was by a Christian group anyway. But proselytizing any religion was against military guidelines. So when the military chaplain found out, the books were confiscated and eventually burned. In 2012, a Taliban suicide bomber attacked the same base for revenge after news got out that four Qurans had been accidentally burned. Um, the holy books, uh, the Muslim holy books were part of a collection that had been confiscated from prisoners and burned. Wow. Outrage over the burning led to protests across Afghanistan that left 30 people dead. Wow. Now, this this is actually the oddest of all. Uh, one of the weirder burning book stories also comes out of the U.S. Minutes, military um, because former Army Reserve and Defense Intelligence Officer Anthony Schaefer submitted his memoir, Operation Dark Heart, for Pentagon approval. You may remember this book. Um, but anyway... As it stands, by the time intelligence officials flagged 200 passages, they said contained classified information, 10,000 copies had already been published. So the Defense Department, what do you think they did? Did they burn the book? But how would they get them? There are 10,000. How would they do They bought them, Alexis. (laughs) They paid the publisher nearly $50,000, purchased the books, and burned them. News of the book burning bolstered sales. I remember this because people was like, oh, the government is burning this book and I can go to Barney's and No Blaze and get it myself. <laughs> Barney's and No Blaze. People love mess. And so the sales do. skyrocketed. Even, <laughs> even with redacted, large sections redacted, sales of this book skyrocketed. And the publisher went on to actually it was an attorney for the author he went on to say i can only wish that the government would destroy more of my clients books <laughs> and that's a brief history of the long history of book burning throughout the world this is a trend mm-hmm. you ready to take a break do. yeah let's do it <laughs> all right let's do it some background on our author Marcus Zusak and perhaps their inspiration for the book thief. Okay, so Marcus Zusak was born in Australia to a mother from Germany and a father from Austria. Uh, He graduated from the University of New South Wales and has a diploma in education. He has um, written six books. The first is titled The Underdog, and it was published in 1999. The book we're covering today was published in 2005 and is a book of historical fiction. It is one of Zuzak's most popular books. It became an international bestseller and was translated into 63 language and sold 16 million copies. It was adapted into a film in 2013. So, regarding um, his inspiration, I didn't come up with that, my. Okay. All right, no worries. Um, can you give us a brief synopsis of the book without spoilers? Around World War II, 
10-year-old Lizo has experienced an early life of loss. Journey with her as she finds comfort in a new family, friend, and books. Mm. Kari, who do you think would enjoy reading this book? Oddly, I think if you enjoyed The Midnight Library, because there is a character in this book that serves a fantastical function um, while uh, um, a greater story is being told. So I, I don't know why, but I, I, that's the first book that came to my mind. Also, if you're someone who loves fictional history, of course, or historical fiction, I should say, then this is the book for you. And Alexis, why did you choose this book? Um, it had been on my book list for a while, um, just as initially looking for books when we started the podcast. So I put this from my to be read um, list. And so I was looking through Libby, looking for a book, and this came up and it sounded interesting. But when I was talking to a friend, she was like, um, I told you about that book. So apparently I was told about this book. It stuck with me. It was on my list. So I picked it up and. And, you know, I was ready to read it. I love it. That's good of a reason as any. Well, if you're ready, we'll dive deep into the first part of the plot of uh, The Book Thief All by right. Marcus Zusak. Take it away. All right. So our narrator begins the story by telling us a small fact. We are all going to die. Then he explains that he wants to tell us the story of a perpetual survivor, a book thief. A girl. This girl he has seen three times. The first time he saw this little girl was on a train. The next time he saw her, a pilot had crashed his plane. The third time he saw her was after a bombing. This story is told by death about a girl left behind. Part one A Train to Heaven. Liesl is on a journey with her mom and her brother across Germany in January of 1939. It's cold. They're malnourished. They were traveling east to west. The east was currently being starved because they were considered communists. Enter death, his first connection to Liesl. Liesl's little brother dies on the train and is buried near the tracks. During the burial service, the grave digger the grave digger drops a book and Liesl picks it up and squirrels it away in her coat. That's the English term, okay? Back to the journey. Liesl and her mother continue on their journey where Liesl ends up being left by her mother at the home of a couple who expected to foster she and her brother. The couple are Hans and Rosa Huberman. They live on Himmel Street, which is translated heaven, in the town of Mulching, which is in Munich. Hans is a kind gentleman, a painter, an accordion player. His wife, Rosa, is a ballax. <laughs> that, that's She's an old crotchety lady uh -huh. with a bad mouth on her. And this is the part of the book where you're like, oh, no. Some terrible foster family is going to abuse this beautiful exactly. little girl. Mm -hmm. Nah, it don't work out like that. They just colorful people. They got their really. She's like, the little girl is like, this woman is mean, and I love her. I can't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> so Rosa, who she would later call Mama, and Hans, who she would call Papa. Rosa does laundry for some of the families in the community who can afford that extra service. You know, we talked about that a little bit last week. Add that service if you can. Um, That's right. Can you do laundry for your neighbors? <laughs> hey. Can hey, you? hey, <laughs> hey. Liesl is hesitant to go to the Huberman home, but eventually she joins them under the kindness of Hans. The first two weeks were difficult. Lisa refused to bathe, but Hans befriended her and taught her to roll cigarettes. Mm, close to my heart. <laughs> Eventually, she would bathe. Every night at the Hum Huberman home, Lisa would have nightmares of her brother. She would wake screaming, and Hans would come into her room and sit with her. When she'd awake in the morning, he'd play the accordion for her. 
as Liesel, as Liesel settles into life in Western Germany, she meets Rudy Steiner, the golden hair mm-hmm. boy next door. Rudy loves to run and he is really fast. And so he loves blackface. You'll explain. <laughs> Rudy has been obsessed <laughs> with Jesse Owens since he cleaned up at the 1936 Olympics. He won four gold medals. Even the most racist Germans could not help but be amazed. And no one was more impressed than Rudy Steiner. One time, Rudy decides to make himself black. So he covers himself with charcoal and heads to the track. He runs commentary in his head, imagining himself as Jesse Owens. His father discovers him smeared in charcoal and scolds him. (laughs) He said, you shouldn't want to be black. And Rudy's like, why? Because he's the best. Rudy is considered a little crazy because of that event. Yeah, it should be said that there's some nuance in the father's reprimanding. All these parents want their children to stay alive. So you shouldn't want to be black, Jewish, or anything that isn't what you are. You were born with this safe, blonde hair, these beautiful blue eyes, and we hope this keeps you alive for a little longer. And and Rudy's like, but dad, I just want to be Jesse Owens. And the dad is like, I know. I know, baby. I know. (laughs) Just like that. Well, one day, Rudy challenged Liesl to a race to which he would receive a kiss if he won. And I So Rudy is like the book describes him. He's not the um anti-feminist type of little boy who likes to hit girls and stuff. He does hit Liesl, but that's because he like her. And he like, if I beat you, you gotta kiss me. He he's a little <laughs> ladies' man in his mind. <laughs> the ladies' man, he has one woman in his mind, one young girl yeah, in his true. mind, and it's Liesl. Mm-hmm. She um, wins the race, probably with a little cheating, I believe, because um, he is the fastest, and they become firm friends. How, however, Rudy is still hoping for that kiss. There's a nice little um, quote that Dust says: "The only thing worse than a boy who hates you is a boy who loves you." Yeah. <laughs> one evening, Liesl has one of her nightmares, and this time she wets the bed. Papa again comes to her rescue. As he's helping to clean her up, he notices a book that Liesl stole. The book is titled The Gravedigger's Handbook. Hans quickly learns that Liesl cannot read. And although he says he's not a good reader, he begins a nighttime class teaching Liesl to read using the stolen book. She stole it from her um her brother's grave site. It was when she looks at it, she thinks of her mother and brother. Although she can't read, that's why the book is dear to her. In the night, Liesel dreamed like she always did. At first, she saw the brown shirts marching, but soon enough, they led her to a train and the usual discovery awaited. Her brother was staring again. When she woke up screaming, Liesel knew immediately that on this occasion, something had changed. A smell leaked out from under the sheets, warm and sickly. At first, she tried convincing herself that nothing had happened. But as Papa came closer and held her, she cried and admitted the fact in his ear. Papa, she whispered, Papa. And that was all. He could probably smell it. He lifted her gently from the bed and carried her into the washroom. The moment came a few minutes later. We take the sheets off, Papa said. And when he reached under and pulled at the fabric, something loosened and landed with a thud. A black book with silver writing on it came hurling out and landed on the floor between the tall man's feet. He looked down at it. He looked at the girl, who timidly shrugged. Then he read the title with concentration aloud. The Grave Digger's Handbook. So that's what it's called, Lisa thought. A patch of silence stood amongst them now. The man, the girl, the book. He picked it up and spoke soft as cotton. A 2 a.m. conversation. Is this yours? Yes, Papa. Do you want to read it? Again. Yes, Papa. A tired smile, metallic eyes melting. Well, we'd better read it then. 
Four years later, when she came to write in the basement, two thoughts struck Liesel about the trauma of wetting the bed. Firstly, she felt extremely lucky that it was Papa who discovered the book. Fortunately, when the sheets had been washed previously, Rosa had made Lisa strip the bed and make it up and be quick about it. Does it look like we've got all day? Secondly, she was clearly proud of Hans Huberman's part in her education. You wouldn't think it, she wrote, but it was not so much the school who helped me read it. It was Papa. People think he's not so smart, and it's true that he doesn't read too fast, but I would soon learn that words and writing actually saved his life once, or at least words, and a man who taught him the accordion. First things first, Hans Huberman said that night. He washed the sheets and hung them up. Now, he said upon his return, let's get this midnight class started. The yellow light was alive with dust. Liesel sat on cold, clean sheets, ashamed, elated, the thought of bedwetting prodded her, but she was going to read. She was going to read the book. The excitement stood up in her. Visions of a 10-year-old reading genius were set alight. If only it was that easy. I tell you the truth, Papa explained up front. I am not such a good reader myself. But it didn't matter that he read slowly. If anything, it might have helped that his own reading pace was slower than average. Perhaps it would cause less frustration in coping with the girl's lack of ability. Still, initially, Hans appeared a little uncomfortable holding the book and looking through it. When he came over and sat next to her on the bed, he leaned back, his legs angling over the side. He examined the book again and dropped it on the blanket. Now, why would a nice girl like you want to read such a thing? Again, Liesel shrugged. Had the apprentice been reading the complete works of Goethe or any other such luminary, that was what would have sat in front of them. She attempted to explain. I, when it was sitting in the snow and the soft-spoken words fell off the side of the bed, emptying onto the floor like powder. Papa knew what to say, though. He always knew what to say. He ran a hand through his sleepy hair and said, Well, promise me one thing, Liesel. If I die anytime soon, you make sure they bury me right. She nodded with great sincerity. No skipping chapter six or step four in chapter nine. He laughed, as did the bedwetter. Well, I'm glad that's settled. We can get on with it now. He adjusted his position and his bones creaked like itchy floorboards. The fun begins. Amplified by the still of night, the book opened. A gust of wind. Part two, start of the war. As times got harder from the war, Rosa, uh, or Mama, would start losing her, her laundry customers, one even justifying their chain, saying, the Hubermans must get an allowance for that girl. Disappointed, Mama would decide to start sending Liesel to pick up the laundry and pay. She felt they'd have a harder time telling a child they no longer wanted her services. Liesel would take her friend Rudy along with her as she exchanged the laundry. One of the people on the route was the town mayor, and Mama told Liesel that the mayor's wife was mourning her son. Liesel would eventually go to school, and at the age of 10, she was enrolled in the Hitler Youth Program, where they were taught to hire Hitler, among other things, walk in a formation or march in a formation. In school, Liesel is ridiculed for not being able to read. So this boy, he came wrong to her, y'all, um, and she beat the brakes off of him. And then another <laughs> kid uh, looked like he was doing something. And he you was know, rooting for her. In his heart, she, he rooting for her, but she didn't take it that way, so she had to beat him up, too. She beat I'm him like, up wow, also. I really like Lisa. She was like, I may not be able to read, sir, but I am not stupid. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I repeat, she beat the brakes off of both of those boys. Okay. <laughs> Now, being a part of the Hitler Youth Division, Liesel was required to participate in the Fuhrer's birthday celebration. As part of the celebration, there would be like a celebratory fire in the town square. In addition to commemorating the Fuhrer's birthday, they would celebrate the victory over their enemies and over the restraints that held Germany back since World War I. Any materials, posters, books, flags, any found propaganda of their enemies were to be brought forward for burning. 
during the bonfire, Liesel hears the word communist and it's repeated throughout the uh, celebratory speech. Mm -hmm. Um, And she puts it together that her parents were probably communists because she remembers hearing that expression back home. And it explains their situation in life, her mm-hmm. biological parents, not her foster parents. Right, right. And that her um, biological parents were likely taken by Hitler, but also her mom was sick, so her mom could have felt ill. And, um, anyway, Papa agrees. She has this conversation with Papa, and she's like, what are communists? Were my parents communists? Is that thing? He was like, yeah, probably. I, I think so. Hitler probably got him. Liesl says aloud that she hates the Fuhrer. I hate him. Papa slaps Liesl squarely on the face and tells her quietly not to do that. Don't ever say that. He said, you can say it at home. Go ahead. Yeah, they were out of doors. So again, all parents have this fear that their child will do something that will... um, that will cause their child to never be seen again. Mm -hmm. So this little girl is like, I hate Hitler. Whoa. (laughs) So the fear of losing her causes the foster father to act in a way that is contrary to his nature. He hits her hard. She's crying. He wants to wrap her up in a hug, but he will not. And he tells her, don't you ever speak like this? And then he bends down like Alexa says that you, you could say this at the house, but please don't ever say this outside. Okay. Ever again in your life. Right. And or I will like stab you and cut you up in little pieces. <laughs> He's trying to just scare her. Exactly. So she, and she like, whoa, yes, sir. No, <laughs> no problem, sir. Yeah. Woo. And after that incident, they together, let's see if we could do this. Let's hail Hitler. So they practice hailing Hitler. So as they head home, Lizzo and Papa walk past the bonfire and Papa is called by a friend and he kind of walks away. Lisa kind of stands nearby, but then she wanders off to this fiery heap and sees an opportunity and snatches a book from the fire. The book's soaking gasoline. It's halfway burnt, but the pages are intact. So she throwing in her coat. Now she on fire, but she ain't gonna tell nobody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, when Papa yeah, but- finished talking and he joins her, the book is like really burning her, as Kari said. <laughs> so Lisa like takes it out of her, it's on fire in her bosom. She takes it out. She kind of playing hot potato with the book until it cools. And then Papa's like, what is that? And he realizes <laughs> Lisa has stolen another book. He tells her that he won't tell mama about this book. It'll be their secret. And he'll even help her read this book. Um, but he also says, I need you to promise that if I ever ask you to keep her secret, you'll do it. She promised. Mm -hmm. Liesl's stolen book gave Papa an idea. He has sold cigarettes before to buy Liesl two books for her birthday. He would now sell his cigarettes to buy another book. Mein Kampf. Mm -hmm. Liesl knew the mayor's wife had seen her pick up the book, so she started skipping the house until Mama said, you better not Go come back laundry. here <laughs> without that laundry. One more time. Mm-hmm. Don't come back here without that laundry. So Lizzo and Rudy, they head to the mayor's house. Um, afraid Lizzo's afraid of what's gonna happen, but Lizzo is surprised by the mayor's wife where action the mayor's wife reaction. First of all the visits Lizzo has made to this house, the wife has never spoken a word to Lizzo. But when the mm-hmm. wife opened the door. Liesl, um told her she was there for the laundry and the wife was like, wait. She was like, whoa, she speaks? The <laughs> wife returns with a stack of books and invites Liesl into the home. Liesl's afraid she'll be tortured by the mayor's wife if she goes inside, but instead she's directed to the wife's study and where there she sees walls of books. And she is like, Wow, where did this, you know, amaze. I would be too. I love a library. The mm-hmm. mayor's wife invited her to read this book, even take a book, but the white, um, and share this library with her. It is uh, books that belong to her son. Mm-hmm. As we mentioned, her son had died and she's mourning her son. 
Now Liesl has a place to come read books every week. Part three, meeting Max. Death next tells us the story of Max. Max was hiding in a secret storage room in Stuttgart. The room is dark. He's hungry. He didn't even know how long he had been there. And he was sitting on a suitcase. Suddenly, a voice comes. Sorry, it's taken so long. I think people have been watching me. And the man with the identity card took longer than I thought. Max is then given an identity card, a book with a map, a key, and food. And the man leaves, promising to return within a few days. A few days turns in to be longer. When his childhood friend finally returns, he, gave, he gives him a train ticket from Stuttgart to Munich to Passing. A small razor, a spoon for a mirror, a shaving cream, and a pair of scissors. Max, um, I believe he shaves first and then he boards this train holding the book. The book is Mein Kampf. Max arrives at the home of the accordion player and asks, are you Hans, Hans Huberman? Do you still play the accordion? Will you still help me? Let's um, flash back for a moment. Papa, or Hans Huberman, participated in World War I and befriended a German Jew named Eric Vanderberg, and he played the accordion. Eric taught Papa to play the accordion. The accordion that Papa regularly played at home belonged to Eric. One day, Eric volunteered Papa's handwriting skills to assist the sergeant. That this part I really love because this happens. I mean, I've heard real life stories of similar situations. Mm -hmm. So um, the head of their platoon will say, because I don't know the proper uh, terminology, comes in and tells his men, we need someone with good handwriting. This platoon is so close knit that no one wants to miss the battle that day. They want to all fight side by side. Even their leader is a man they respect and love because he's the first one on the battlefield. So he never sends his men without going ahead first himself. But he comes in with this request. No one will raise their hand. Then, But someone, there's a reason um, they don't want to raise yeah. their hand, right? It's because... That's what I'm saying, because they want to fight side by side. No one wants to be held back. Well, not only that, that is also in there, but also when they get these assignments, sometimes these assignments are the worst assignments you could possibly get, and they don't want to do those either. This friend volunteers, wh who we now know to be the foster dad, and the foster dad is like, man, I mean, I can write, but sure, fine. So he steps up. He's taken out of the group and all the men go off into war. Go ahead. And die. <laughs> all of them die. All Every them. single one. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the one that stepped up to volunteer the other man's services saved that other man's life. Yeah. So Papa is forever grateful. That was the mm -hmm. last day he saw his friend Eric. And so mm -hmm. he goes to Eric's widow and he tells her, you can always count on me. A Jew has saved his life. So he doesn't feel the way Hitler feels about the Jews. Mm -hmm. So when, a, when Max arrives at the Huberman home, the Hubermans take care of Max. Max grew up loving a good fist fight. Max grew <laughs> up loving a good fist fight. And when he saw his uncle die, what, what he described as an accepting face, he asked himself, where's the fight? And he never wanted to come up against death and not fight and back. And be passive. Yeah. Yeah. So he learned to fight and his childhood enemy became his friend and his sparring buddy. So when the night of broken glass occurred in 1938, Max's childhood friend came for him. He took him into hiding and made sure he made it to safety. All right, so let's get back to current times. When Liesl learns of Max, she is sworn to secrecy. She is not, um, she's told, don't even tell Rudy. 
When Max arrived, he slept for three days. First, he shared a room with Liesl. Um, That bed that's next to Liesl's bed was originally for her brother, but of course we know he died. Max and Liesl share some similarities. They both arrived, they both arrived to Heaven Street in a state of agitation. They mm. both have nightmares and they are both fighters. Mm. Liesl and Max, they became fast friends. Max decided he didn't deserve to share a room with Liesl and moved to the basement. Soon, um, as it got colder, of course, it was too cold for Max to be in the basement. So Papa would suggest that he come up at night and go to uh, the basement in the daytime. And that way, when, if people looked in, even though the blinds were down, there was no chance of him being seen. Mm-hmm. While he was upstairs at night, he would read Mein Kampf. And Liesl eventually asked him, is it a good book? He answered, <laughs> it's the best book ever. It saved my life. Liesl has her 12th birthday. It's 1941. The war. And if you guys don't know, like Mein Kampf means my fight or my struggle. Yeah, my fights, my struggle. Um, and it's by Adolf Hitler. Mm-hmm. And people actually still uh, actually do read and love that book. I was at a book fair in Mexico City and it was a lot of Mein Kampf. Oh, a lot of copies. OK. Yeah. Um, so it's her birthday and the Hubermans give Liesl another book. Okay, of course, she loves books, so she's happy. You and said the humans? The Hubermans. The oh. Hubermans. <laughs> that okay, okay. So Max feels bad. Um, he didn't know it was her birthday, um, but he decides he wants to give her a gift too. So mm-hmm. what does Max do? He cuts out pages from Mein Kampf. He paints over them with white paint, hangs in the dry, and then ties the pages together and creates a 13-page book titled The Standover Man for Liesl. I loved this. Yeah, it's so Now, cute. there's a, um, they have to keep Liesl out of the basement because she likes to go visit Max. And mm-hmm. they talk, they have deep conversations, and they're kindred spirits, yeah. I guess you could or souls, I could say. Um, but when they're trying to keep her out of there so that Max can prepare her gift, uh, the mom is like, why are you always going in that basement? Go do some laundry or go do this, go do that. Yeah. But that's her way of showing love yeah. Um, so that the surprise is ready for Lisa and she's really excited yeah. about it. But I, Alexis is not giving the woman here due credit, but the foster mama is hilarious. She is. She is. She, is. she will wake up in the middle of the night and be like, you hear that, Lisa? And Lisa will be like, what, mama? That um, our neighbor spit on our door again. <laughs> Go clean it off. <laughs> and sure enough, the <clears throat> neighbors hate her. And they spit on the door sometimes, and the little girl or the the husband will go clean it. Yeah, so anyway, little stuff like that throughout the book add a little, some comedy. Yeah. Okay, so. But go ahead with this beautiful gift from Matt. Yeah, so he gives her um, this, this handmade book, and he's written a story in it. It's a story about mm-hmm. himself. Lovely story. The Standover Man by Max Vanderberg. All my life, I've been scared of men standing over me. I suppose my first standover man was my father, but he vanished before I could remember him. For some reason, when I was a boy, I liked to fight. A lot of time, I lost. Another boy, sometimes with blood falling from his nose, would be standing over me. Many years later, I needed to hide. I tried not to sleep because I was afraid of who might be there when I woke up. But I was lucky. It was always my friend. When I was hiding, I dreamt of a certain man. The hardest was when I was traveling to find him. Out of sheer luck and many footsteps, I made it. I slept there for a long time. Three days, they told me. And what did I find when I woke? Not a man, but someone else standing over me. As time passed, The girl and I realized we had things in common. But there is one strange thing. The girl says I look like something else. Now I live in a basement. Bad dreams still live in my sleep. One night after my usual nightmare, a shadow stood above me. She said, tell me what you dream of. So I did. In return, she explained what her own dreams were made of. Now I think we are friends this girl and me. On her birthday, it was she who gave a gift to me. 
it makes me understand that the best standover man I've ever known is not a man at all. What a beautiful book. Don't you wish all books were as condensed and as meaningful as this? I do. I do. And it was so <laughs> special. Ugh, it, was. it really was. Yeah. Max would later give Liesl another gift. He used the same method, and this time he left the pages blank. He wanted to encourage Liesl to write, so it was a diary for her. So I'll conclude by um, part one by telling you that the day Liesl goes to pick up laundry from the mayor's wife, instead of more laundry, mm -hmm. she receives a letter in an envelope. Liesl leaves and eventually reads the letter. And what does the letter say, Kari? You're being terminated. The letter, it, the gist of it is, as others are suffering around us, we cannot in good conscience keep a laundry service. And so we will do our own laundry in solidarity with our fellow man. And um, Lisa is reading this on her way to her mom, and she's like, how am I going to explain this? This is our last customer. We have a secret Jewish man living in the basement and three miles of our own to feed. So four total. And this is our last, last client. And as they sit high on the hill, they're firing us to appease their conscience so that they look like they're in, in solidarity with society when really they have enough money, of course, to support their fellow man through this labor. So it's hypocritical. And you know what? Now I'm mad and I'm going to go back to the mayor's house and tell her you're bitter because your son is dead or chopped up or whatever he is. And I hate you. I hate your guts. And um, yeah. And when you gave me them books, I was saying thank you and I was kind. But now you're the last person on my list. And I hope you never forget it. So Lisa went back and gave her what for um, and how mm -hmm. long and whoever did you know? I mean, she put it all to her. And she obviously hurts the woman. I'm she, She's bringing up her dead son. And then she go back home. She got that from like, her oh, mama. The mayor. From her foster mom. <laughs> from her foster mom. <laughs> And so she go back home and the foster mom is like, where's the laundry, little girl? And Lisa was like, oh, I um, snapped on the mayor's wife. And so she don't want us to do their laundry no more. And the foster mom is not. Yeah, old. she said, I don't believe you. And then she said, but I did say those things. She said, even if you did say them, I know that's not you why. You had good reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. They love yeah, they her. Do. It's a lot of love in this house. Yeah. So they have no way of bringing in money to feed themselves anymore. And now there's four um, miles. If Lisa leaves the room. Yeah, not four miles. And so Lisa leaves the room and she hears some a little bit of chaos in the kitchen as the mom breaks down yeah. and physically breaks dishes, I think. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of part one. Is there anything um, additional you'd like to include that you feel I left out, Kari? So far, what a what a way to tell a tale that we've all heard a million times, um, but not in this specific way. And I love the way the adults show this little girl appropriate love. Um, I feel Max's shame as he must depend on everyone around him for everything. And he just wants to give something. He sees people mm -hmm. giving this little girl a gift. And he's like, why didn't anyone tell me I would have given her a gift? He ain't got, nothing, ain't got to nothing to give. But, he's but like, he did. I do. Mm -hmm. He did. But he, he did. did. Yeah. Even when you have. So far, so beautiful. Lovely. So even when you have nothing, you, you, can, you can give. give. You can still give. Um, oh, one of the Go things ahead. in the um, book that I did not include is the still and spree. The thievery. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. Uh, Rudy and um, Lisa just become little thugs and they start stealing apples. Then they upgrade to more apples. <laughs> They hungry, really. They just yeah. Hungry. These are hungry children, um, trying to feed themselves because that that it was hard. It was really hard during this time. So they weren't, um, they didn't always have food. And Rudy has five other brothers and sisters, and mm -hmm. so he always yeah, hungry. So he's always hungry. So still, and they did it, and um. I mean, they found a quarter or something, a coin on the ground, went and bought one piece of candy, and each took a turn sucking it. <laughs> This is how it's going on. Oh, this is what's going oh, on. Oh, yeah. They take it out of one person, take out their mouth, give it to their friend. They suck a little bit. Oof. I wanted to throw up. But they was they hungry. They was hungry. But know? then also the storekeeper, she was, she, she is a, 
she's a, a mean lady also so that's a whole nother mm-hmm. thing but anyway that brick go ahead well they their final theft in this first part uh <laughs> the owner of the <laughs> of the field they steal it from chases them mm-hmm. with a knife and rudy almost meets mm-hmm. his end but don't worry death already told us rudy gonna die soon so don't get too attached Aww. But get attached because this is the type of story yeah. it is. So yeah. uh, let's just take a quick break um, before we close out. Okay, sounds good. And we're back. All right. So I, I, I did get your thoughts about... Um, what was left out but i really would like to hear what your initial thoughts are on part one of the book so when i meet um death i feel like what book alexis got me reading this week well i don't do this but uh as death develops um i do think this is just a really ingenious way to talk about the time And um, Death talks about the colors of the time, the gray of the sky, the white of the sky, the despair, um, how grief can even be gray, how white is a color and it can it's a color that can just surround you and envelop you. Um, There's a lot of poetry in the words. Um, So from the very first page, I was all in. I thought the way the story was being told was so captivating. What about you? What did you think about the first part? Yeah, I would love to have been able to retell death story with the colors but I couldn't figure out how to do it as poetically as the book does it there's so much poetry in this book and I just like I think I fell in love with that in this first part Mm -hmm. um the way death says things um there are these bold sections within the book and um not sections, just maybe a paragraph or just a couple of words. And mm-hmm. it's just beautifully said the mm-hmm. way death says. So, you know, these first section, I'm really enjoying it. Um, the characters and the, um, this, the narration, I really do. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I can't wait to get to next week, part two of the book thief. Well, you guys, um, I just want to remind you listeners to please send us via Instagram, email, however you want to reach out to us, your plan for making $10,000 in 10 days, uh, when you plan to start and how we can support you. We'll share our plan next week. All right. Well, next week, we will also read part two of this book. And thank you for listening to Lit Society. We'll see you next Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Anaria and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review of our show on Apple Podcasts. I'll leave a five-star review on Spotify also, please. But if you leave one on Apple Podcasts, also leave a comment about why you absolutely love, we love us. Too. We love y'all too. If you've enjoyed what you just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, you guys. Read, read something. Read something.